This is a debate between Dr. Lenos and Christopher Hitchens. Now, what I'll be doing in this video is providing biblical answers to questions Mr. Hitchens asked, which weren't answered during the debate. As we all know, Mr. Hitchens asked a lot of questions, most of which Mr. Lenos missed. So I'll be doing justice to those. Okay, without wasting any more time, let's. They say that they're humble, these believers in God. They want to be written up as, 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 as modest because they think that, of course, that God tells them they're worms, originally sinful, ingrates, incurable. Uh, made out of dust in one narrative, out of a clot of blood in the Quranic narrative, bad, off to a pretty shaky start, uh, con con condemned since an original fall of man. Nonetheless, cheer up. The universe is designed with you in mind. This is a depraved form of sadomasochism in, in, in my view. It's not good for you to go from this terrible abjection and serfdom in the one instance to this belief that you are the center of creation and the object of the cosmos in, in the other. It's, it's a terrible alternation, a neurotic alternation between being much too servile and much too arrogant. No, but just locally, what, was it, what would it be to believe this? Suppose you did believe that everything that had brought us here was by design. Uh, well, we know that 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed just on this planet have become extinct. So heaven has already watched almost 100% of its creation die off, often in very unpleasant, callous circumstances, with folded arms, right? And that's billions of years of geological time. Some people say the Homo sapiens has been around for 100,000 years, some for as long as a quarter of a million. No one says less than 100,000. Francis Collins, the great Christian believer who did the Human Genome Project says certainly 100,000. I'll take 100. Richard Dawkins thinks it's more. I'll take 100. What does it mean if we're divinely supervised and divinely created and what looked out for? It means that for 98 or so thousand of those years, humans, homo sapiens, were being born, dying, half of them in childbirth, I would think, life expectancy maybe of 20 years, maybe 30, people dying essentially of their teeth out of hideous diseases, living in permanent fear. Where are the earthquakes coming from? Where are the lightning strikes coming from? Why is all this? Where, where, what are these diseases that hit us? We don't know about microbes, we have no idea. Um, that's to say nothing about the fights with neighboring tribes over women, over land, over meat, over subsistence, the, the, the torture, the, the violence, the cruelty uh, that goes on. Um, I don't need to underline all of it, I hope. You can picture it for yourself. 98,000, the first 98,000 years, heaven watches this going on with perfect insouciance. And something like two to 3,000 years ago decides, right, we have to intervene now. We have to do something about this. Well, what would be the best way of intervening to try and redeem this rather bleak picture? What about having somebody tortured to death in an obscure part of the Middle East? That ought to cure it. Or if you're a Muslim, what about getting an illiterate epileptic shepherd to start babbling and saying that he's been talking to an archangel? Or what, or what about um, inventing the figure of, of Moses in the, a, a, a mountain that's never yet been found by any geographer of Mount Sinai? That's what you'd have to believe. I've got a minute, right? That's what you'd have to believe, and that's why I ask myself, why do the worshippers of this God want to convict him of being such a crummy designer, most of his creations die off, and the rest suffer miserably, and, and the redemptive offers just don't somehow take, of being cruel and capricious and bungling and, and incompetent, why, and callous uh, as a father. And so, since this is as far as I can get now, I have to tell you why I don't think the idea of an eternal father is a good one in any case when I next get the chance to draw breath. But thank you for staying with me this far. Christopher contradicts himself so bad. To say God is not good is a moral statement. And so now my question is, on what grounds or standard does he look up to 
or used in measuring the ungratefulness of God since he is a subjectivist and a bit relative as well. Why does he care? It shouldn't be a problem to atheists at all since nothing matters. We are all worm food. Evil wouldn't be judged. There is nothing after death. Heaven is simply an illusion religion uses in bullying people into believing in a sky daddy. Now to Mr. Hitchens' main question. If truly there is a God, then why do we suffer? Why evil in this world if God is good? Now this answer I'm about to provide is purely biblical but I hope you take the time to hear me out. God's initial plan wasn't that man would suffer. God blessed man with so much power such that man could even choose or reject God. Now this is how I see it after reading the Bible, not the entire Bible but the little I've read so far, this is what I think. One part of the relationship between God and man has to do with asking and receiving. God in his own person never conceived the idea of creating man to function like a robot. Man wasn't built from scraps but rather created in the image of God. For this reason, God set rules for himself, the heavens and man. Exactly what we would refer to as code of ethics or conduct and these codes God himself does not break them. Man would have the freedom he wants, have access to all God has made, live by God's tried and tested code of conduct, but man's freedom would give him the ability to only involve God in his decision making if he chooses. This way, God doesn't just get to show up in the bloom issuing autocratic rules over the plans of man and we see this throughout the entire Bible. The only time we see God in the affairs of man is when man seeks God after failure had set in. God counsels man but doesn't force his counsel on man. God tells man to do good and shun evil but doesn't force man to do good and shun evil. Man possessed his possession and God couldn't interfere in any of his decisions. Man lived in peace and harmony, lacked nothing and fully had access to God as and when he wanted. As time lived by, the accuser of the brethren fell from the presence of God and decided why not go after God's most beloved creation, right? He found his way into the garden and after many attempts to cut the narrative short, man thought it not cool to be man anymore. It would be better if she were a god. Man chose to this time not involve God in her decision to partake of the tree of good and evil. Man's free will to choose was over exercised and that decision cost him greatly. Oh and by the way, man was fully aware of the consequences should they go against those rules. This is what we call sin. Sin never wants to have anything to do with God. Sin enslaves, commands, and substitute endurance for comfort. Sin is conceived and as a result of that, eats the humility and fear for the things that are above man's wisdom. Sin never wants God involved. It's just like us today. We do not seek for any advice if we want to sin. We just want to do it quick and wipe our mouths clean. One might ask, if God is good, then why did he place the tree in the garden knowing it would cost man a relationship with God? That's easy. The tree in the garden is what made man's free will complete. Without the ability to consistently make free will decision, there is no free will. In this case, man gets to read his faithful obedience and commitment rather based on his constant decision not to partake of the tree of good and evil. This was the only way man could know he is faithful to God. Man had everything, the only instruction was to choose God and not the tree. Now when it comes to the question of heaven sitting and watching us die off, out of hideous diseases, living in permanent fear, where are the earthquakes coming from? Where are the lightning strikes coming from? Why is all this? Where, where, what are these diseases that hit us? We don't know about microbes, we have no idea. Um, that's to say nothing about the fights with neighboring tribes over women, over land, over meat, over subsistence, the, the, the torture, the, the violence, the cruelty uh, that goes on. 
Um, I don't need to underline all of it, I hope. You can picture it for yourself. 98,000, the first 98,000 years, heaven watches this going on with perfect insouciance. And something like two to 3,000 years ago decides, right, we have to intervene now. I would simply call it a curse. And so man sinned and exposed himself to a curse. That curse brought suffering and suffering would lead to death. I have a whole video on why Jesus was made a curse for us. Dope video. You should check it out. Link in the description below. If you've loved the video so far, kindly leave me a sub and a like, share. Okay, let's continue. We read, the day you would eat of this tree, you shall die. But it's interesting man chose death. Now it's either man would endure till death or simply suffer and die. Endurance in the sense of being in Christ or suffer alone as one opposing God. Suffering comes in so many ways. The most common we see today are sickness and poverty. Sickness as a result of lack and poverty as a result of greed and corruption, which is also a type of lack to some extent. Interestingly, it is not as if God is making or watching people suffer. We keep inflicting pain on ourselves and others. We are the problem, but man loves to blame. And so we choose to blame God instead of calling on God. Adam, the first man, began the blame game. He could have consulted God before the woman, but he didn't. After he had fallen, he blamed the woman and God. We are no different today. God is good and a part of his goodness is seen based on how he defends good people from evil. Interestingly, man will call God evil if God decides to defend good people from evil, but should God decide to stay out of man's business, man would claim God doesn't exist. Man is just a mess at this point and our only solution is Jesus. Just as it was in the garden, God isn't going to force his will on you. If you don't want to involve God in your life, it's your own decision. I pray God's humility come upon you today so you can seek him. If you need more of these discussions, sure, you can email me or visit Love Economy Church at Bookbath. You can search it up on Google Map. You would find us there.